there's this development of this thing called a spectrum, autism, Asperger's, Rett syndrome, fragile X. And then there's this general idea called pervasive developmental disorders, NOS, not otherwise specified. So what does that mean? Well, there are some behaviors that we really can't contribute to any one specific area. One of the biggest challenges that we have today in working with children that have autism is the focus has traditionally been on the children. And as the children grow and develop through this particular ailment, what we're finding is they're becoming adults. And as they become adults, we're beginning to realize, wow, all this time and service that we've put into them as children, as they begin to transition into adults, we have a very small umbrella there to support them, which is really changing the world on how those that work within the spectrum disorders are focused on what does tomorrow look like. So we'll talk about that as well. You know, back in 1912, a psychiatrist looked at what he thought was a disorder in which something does not interface with what the usual person does. This is an oddity. This is something very unusual. Well, initially, this particular um, idea of what this was in the Journal of Insanity, which you, know, you don't see much of that word used anymore, uh, was the idea that this person obviously has some sort of separation from people to themselves. So it's a self-issue. It's a self. Uh, maybe they don't understand how to understand themselves. So uh, Dr. Uh, Craner at John, John Hopkins University was the first actual person that was given credit for truly creating the diagnostic for autism. See, if we go to the previous slide, it turns out that what they found prior to this was actually schizophrenia. It wasn't autism. Autism was something a little bit different. Well, today, both Asperger's syndrome and autism in the DSM-4 are categorized as developmental disorders um, by impairment of communication skills, social interactions, restrictive and or repetitive patterns of behavior. If you look at the idea of a spectrum, here's one of the easiest ways to kind of demonstrate what autism is. Anywhere within this color spectrum, you can find any of the categories of what they call pervasive developmental disorders. There is no one definitive thing that says this is autism for sure without a doubt, because the characteristics kind of interflow between, so you can have different components. So you'll find that there's autism, Asperger's, Rett syndrome, and child disintegrative disorder. These are the different, most common that you'll see. You'll see also a few other ones, a little bit more genetic, biologically based, such as fragile X disorder. So when you look at that, a lot of clinicians, as they go through the assessments with these children, they'll say, hmm, have some characteristics of autism. There are some characteristics of rats. Rats is a little bit more physical in nature than autism. However, the characteristics are not so pervasive so I'm not really sure that I could categorize them as being autistic. But let me switch kind of the mindset here for a second. In order to get assistance today, what do you have to have? Go ahead, say, say a little bit louder for me. A diagnostic, right? Without the diagnostic, imagine on average today, for a child to go through autism treatment uh, through what they call applied behavioral analysis, on average, per child, it's about $20,000 a month. I don't know about you guys, but I sure don't have that kind of money. Without that diagnostic, the governmental support, the private insurance support would not be there for that child. So there's that push sometimes that the parents make to say, oh, I need something, give me something. And that's where we get into pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. Because they can't quite put their finger on what it is, but they know that the family needs help. All right, so these are the different types of spectrum disorders. So let's kind of dive in a little bit and look at each one. So on average, every day in the United States, 67 children will be diagnosed with autism. 67 children. Multiply that by day, by day, by day. And you can begin to see that autism and the spectrum is something that is increasingly growing and growing and growing. Now, here's the question, though. 
Is it growing? Or are we just beginning to determine that it exists? Autism itself is categorized by impairments in social interaction, impairments in, communi in communication, and restrictive and repetitive behaviors. Along with that, you will find a lot of children that are diagnosed with autism uh, develop obsessive compulsive disorder. They have an obsession towards an object or towards a particular element. One out of 110 children are being diagnosed with autism uh, within the spectrum today, according to uh, the CDC for 2010. If you go back a couple of years, they thought that it was one in 150. Even that has transitioned and the numbers are coming down. Again, the question begs to ask, is it that autism is becoming more pronounced genetically? Is it that we are becoming more aware of what it is? Or was it always there, we just never knew it, and people are just being diagnosed with it more? What is it? It's kind of difficult to understand. So let's go into Asperger's. Asperger's is a spectrum disorder categorized by a marked impairment on the use of multiple nonverbal behaviors. So when you look and you compare Asperger's and autism, there's a couple of things to consider. With the autism disorder, it's generally not like, talk, not like it's not appreciated when it's talked about in this way, but people do it. There's a high functioning and a low functioning autistic person. Your high functioning person tends to be able to communicate better, have uh, less impairment when it comes to logic, to thinking, to cognitive functioning, and your low autistic person tends to be quite the opposite, have a very limited mobility when it comes to those um, cognitive characteristics. So you'll see that spectrum again. So here's the ironic thing is, within the spectrum, there still is another spectrum. And it goes to show how new we are into really attempting to find out what autism really is, how it functions, how it works, how it's categorized. Eye-to-eye -eye movements, facial expressions, clays, body postures, uh, gestures to regulation, social interaction. Uh, there's a uh, group that meets. It's at a location called Trey's House. And uh, it's in the downtown area. And it's a group of Asperger's adults. And what they do is they go and they meet together in the social environment. So they've created uh, a bar, in a sense, without any kind of liquor, without any, anything like that. It's just a physical place where they have pool tables and they have uh, people that play music. And all of these people must be Asperger's diagnosed in order to go there or suspicion of. So it's interesting because you'll see all these groups going to Trey's house. And most of your Asperger's people have a very difficult time interacting socially with other people. So if you're not attuned to where you're walking in, it's really interesting because you'll see a bunch of people in a play interactive environment and they're all kind of just looking at each other. And even then they'll kind of stare down, just occasionally look up and stare down. So you're wondering, okay, here's a social environment for them, but yet none of them are looking at each other. This is kind of odd. You know, I've never been to a social place like this. Progression through the disorder, and here's a misconception. Most people want to cure autism or cure the spectrum. We're never going to be able to cure it. Maybe one day we will, but sometime soon we won't. It's something that the person most likely will live with throughout their entire life. So what we can do is learn to help them develop themselves through the actual disability or the disorder. We can't quite cure it yet, at least. So those environments are important for Asperger's because it helps them to approximate the start of developing social relationships. As they begin to slowly get near people, and we'll get groups together and they'll set out in the groups and it'll be interesting because you'll throw a topic up there and you'll find that your Asperger's are extremely intelligent. You'll find one of them have a passion, most of them will have a passion relative to transportation related items. Whether it's locomotives, whether it's airplanes, whether it's cars, some can tell you absolutely everything you need to know about that item. So if you know that one of them has a topic, you'll throw it out and that person will run the meeting for the next six hours. And after that, they'll stop, take a breath, and say, okay, who would like to know more? And all of a sudden, you see them begin to develop that pure relationship. Rett's disorder. This one, they say, is generally caused by a genetic mutation. Rett's disorder is a little bit different. This one's really, uh, predominantly in, in girls, young girls, um, you'll see most of the characteristics really take place during the second year than you will through the onset. 
Uh, most common cause of severe learning dis disability in girls, and it's again genetic in, in origin. Okay, so there's four general stages that go with Rett's disorder. And stage number one is you'll see the early symptoms not really that noticeable. You see general progression, general development in the child. Um, may not make eye contact. The twix to that is they may. So it may, be, it may seem that the child is developing normally at this point. You may have some, you may not have some eye contact. Not really much interest in toys. And what you'll find is handwriting is slow and head growth is slow, which is one of the key indicators there. So you look at that. Then you go into stage two. This is where between years one and four, you'll begin to see the rapid deterioration. This is where it significantly starts to change. You'll start seeing things like um, purposefully hand movements, uh, inability to speak, uh, hand to mouth movements. The child is like in a blank stare. You're looking at them, they're awake, but they're not there. And there's really nothing you can do to kind of pull them into you. They're just focused out into this other world, um, which is what one of the first diagnostics that they thought was, oh, you know, that's schizophrenia, but it actually wasn't. It was to a certain point a form of Rett's. Um, you may notice episodes of breath holding, hyperventilation, trouble sleeping, they become very irritable. Well, the average child becomes very irritable, but you start looking for these other elements. As you go into the next stage, stage three, this is generally where a lot of them will slow down and stop. This is where they begin to plateau. In stage three, you'll begin to see the most predominant thing is motor functioning uh, begins to decrease and seizures will begin to significantly increase if they haven't happened in stage one or stage two. Um, you'll see some improvement in the child's behavior, less crying, less kind of irritability from them and so forth, uh, but you will also see a greater interest in their surroundings and how they communicate with you. What they are finding in some Rett's children is that their communication process is focused on one person, the person that works with them the most. So whether it's a behavioral therapist, whether it's a speech pathologist, or whether it's you as the parent, uh, or the professional, that connection may develop with you, but it won't necessarily be transferred to somebody else. So that's something generally to look at. Um, most of them will plateau within this area here. Some of them, however, will go to the final stage, which is stage four. This is where they lose all ability to walk, all mobility to move, um, and almost a regression and it's like a regression going back to the infantile stage where you actually begin to see that everything that they had gained is now gone in reverse. So to a certain point, you lose all, the, all of that functioning that they've had. Um, hand movements may decrease again, and the spine, you'll see like a form of scoliosis begin to develop within them as well. These are all some characteristics that you may actually see that start developing when it comes to reds. Okay, so now that we've kind of gone through that one, let's go through the childhood disintegrative disorder. Um, this is very rare. You'll find that on average, you'll have a very, very small population, one to two percent, that actually get uh, diagnosed with this particular disorder. Um, most often it's in children ages three and four. It can go between ages of two and 10. Uh, the things that you're going to find the most that manifest themselves are expressive uh, or repetitive language, social adaptive behavior, bladder or bowel control. These are the elements that are going to be dysfunctional within the child. Again, you're going to see a very small percentage of your population. Now, here's a pop quiz question. Can you have someone that has been diagnosed with pervasive developmental disorder, PDD-NOS, not, not otherwise specified, can you have them have some of these characteristics? without having the full diagnostic. Absolutely, and that's what's important to recognize, is you do not have to have the full diagnostic within the spectrum, within this particular disorder, to be part of within the spectrum. So, you may have characteristics, and that's important to regulate because you do not always apply everything in the same modality. So, children cannot be categorized specifically if they have some components of Asperger's, some components of um, a disagreative disorder, there may be a combination of all. So you have to be aware of that. Now that really kind of goes back to the label, labeling theory. All right, so if this child has these particular components, does then that mean that they are Asperger's for sure or are they not? And how should I work or treat with the child? 
How should I speak with a family when they ask me, well, you know, my child demonstrates these behaviors, but also these, so are they autistic? Are they Asperger's? You know, what is it? I'm not sure how to categorize it. How do you answer that? That's a hard question, isn't it? That's a hard question because we don't really know. All we know is that it is within the spectrum, and that's kind of how we have to address it. So these are basically the more prominent disorders that you will see uh, within the spectrum when it comes to a diagnostic. Here's some warning signs. Loss of social skills, bowel and bladder control. Um, I know some of us here have dealt with children before that are up in age and still have very difficult times controlling their bladders. Uh, expressive receptive language, motor skills, lack of play. Fair to um, develop peer relationships, nonverbal behaviors. Again, if you look at these, couldn't you not categorize a lot of these into the autistic or into the Asperger's? So you can kind of see how they, they all interplay and intertwine together. And that's something that's really important to kind of consider.